Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dun, 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 bum, 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 episode four, A New Hope. You can keep doing the sound if you want. It's the period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil galactic empire. During the battle, rebel spies managed to steal secret plans to the empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. Pursued by the emperor's sinister agents, I've already missed my cue. Uh, <laughs> that's why you don't play the band and do the narration at the same time. Princess Leia races home aboard her starship, custodian of the stolen plans that can save her people and restore freedom to the galaxy. Whew, I think they did it much better in the original uh, Star Wars, but that's how the very first film began that launched the whole Star Wars universe. Episode four, of course, not episode one, even though it was the first uh, of the movies that came out. Because George Lucas employed an ancient Greek tradition of starting his story in Midias race, or in the middle, right? Who could have foreseen that this one film would turn into a multi-billion dollar franchise? Each of the nine uh, core films that came out in the series all had their own opening crawl that, uh, that I just did a horrible job of narrating as it, as it went forward. Um, to, to say either what had just taken place or what had happened in between the, the films that we had seen last and to prepare us for what's coming in the film ahead. It's called a prologue or a preface. And because ancient books largely lacked such formatting features as punctuation, paragraphs, even chapter headings, their authors had to incorporate more information into the text than most modern writers do. And so prologues or prefaces were one way to summarize, provide previews, and mark divisions in the story. And sometimes when there were multiple books written, and in ancient days, especially due to the fact that scrolls had just a limited size, so you had to break up your story, uh, well, prologues would help summarize the content from what happened in the previous work. So, yeah, George Lucas was not the first to use this technique, not by a long shot. Welcome to a brand new sermon series. We're going to do this all through the month of October. It's called Church 1.0, and it's a series about the early Christian church, about how Christianity got started after Jesus' death and resurrection. Because remember, Jesus wasn't Christian, right? Jesus came out of the Jewish faith. Well, the book of Acts is the first book in the New Testament after the four Gospels, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the full title in many Bibles is The Acts of the Apostles. But you could say that's a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't really chronicle all of the first apostles who were the 12 disciples that Jesus called. Former United Methodist Bishop Will Williman says that a better designation might be The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because this book is laying out how the Holy Spirit, or God's unseen presence with us on earth, how the Holy Spirit empowered the early church, turning them from a, uh, you might say, a ragtag group of scared individuals into a powerful force that literally changed the world. Now, as we get ready for this series, it's important to come in with certain expectations when we're reading the book of Acts. Now, you might be su surprised that many scholars do not consider the book of Acts uh, to be church history, at least not in the way that we think of history today. As uh, Will Williman says, it's not an objective, dispassionate reporting of the fact. In fact, one commentator called the book of Acts cultic Biography, meaning it's like a classic biography, but it's told in a way that conveys the mission and ministry of the early church. So the word cult is used in the classic sense, meaning a set of religious devotional practices, uh, not a sinister fringe group like, like we use the word cult today. So Acts is more than just chronicling the past. The book of Acts is really laying out the theology of the early church, of church 1.0 so that we then can apply the lessons from their time into our time today. 
Sometime between AD 70 and 100, somewhere in the Mediterranean world, the book of Acts was written. We don't know exactly who wrote it, but we know that it was the same author who penned the Gospel of Luke. And it's scary when you think about it that these two books, Luke and Acts combined, make up exactly one-fourth of the entire New Testament. Robert Wall, in his New Interpreter Bible commentary on Acts, mentions that it's really important that you come with both books being read together. The story of Luke is vital. If you don't know that and you just pick up and start reading Acts, you're going to miss a whole lot of the backstory that's essential for understanding how the church got formed. So Luke is really telling the Jesus story, the, the story of God's promised salvation. And then Acts picks up where, uh, uh, where the early church begins to continue what Jesus began in helping bring about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So, we're going to get started in the book of Acts, chapter 1, the first two verses. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that G all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So here's how the book of Acts begins. The author is writing this book uh, to a man named Theophilus. Now in Greek, Theophilus means lover or friend of God. And scholars are divided on whether Theophilus was a historical person. Most uh, think he was, but it's not necessarily sure. It could be a, uh, in general to all of us who love God. Perhaps Theophilus was Luke's benefactor who uh, empowered him to write and wanted a comprehensive account of Jesus' life and ministry and resurrection. And, and so like those of us who are coming to hear the story of Acts today, uh, Theophilus knew about Jesus, right? It, it, it was not a new story to him because of the first story that Luke wrote. In fact, the only other time the name Theophilus is mentioned in the New Testament is back in the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke. This is how Luke begins. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Ah, so this is why. Scholars believe ah, the author of Luke was also the author of Acts. So, back to Acts. Luke is uh, reminding Theophilus about, in, remember the first book I wrote? Remember the Jesus story, right? And how the Holy Spirit was not only vital in Jesus' life, but it was the primary means that sent the apostles, the disciples, forth into the world after Jesus' departure. By the way, the Greek word for apostles, apostolos, uh, comes from the, ber the verb apostello, which means to send. And so uh, an apostle was someone who was sent out with something important to give to another. For Luke, the apostles were sent with the message of salvation and grace from Jesus Christ himself. Verse 3, Luke continues. After his suffering... Jesus presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so... Uh, at the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus meets with his disciples uh, right before ascending to be with God. And, and Jesus' final words in Luke's Gospel were twofold. One, don't leave the city. And two, wait for the promise. Now, despite Jesus' impending departure, I got to go, but I don't want you to go either. I want you to stay where you are, right? I mean, when Jesus was first crucified, the, the disciples were huddled in fear together, locked in a room. They were worried that they were going to be the next ones on the religious leaders' hit list. Jesus says, just, just trust me here. Wait. 
Something good is coming. The, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. They had no idea what that meant. But Jesus called them to wait. The great 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth uh, said that this period of waiting for the early church, this time between Jesus' ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we're going to be covering the Pentecost story next week, this time of waiting was a significant pause. A significant pause. It was time in between the mighty acts of God. It was a time for the early church to wait and to pray. Not a time of empty, sitting around, doing nothing. The, the spiritual equivalent of just uh, twiddling your thumbs until something good happens. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus was asking. He wanted them to have expectant waiting. To wait with hope. My senior year of high school, I was accepted into the United States Coast Guard Academy. I was going to be one of 350 incoming cadets for the class, the graduating class of 1990. Now, the summer prior, I had the opportunity to visit the academy for a week during Project AIM. The week was spent as if we were uh, already cadets at the academy, so we get a true feel of what life at the academy was like. Now, this is not a picture of me but this is what I experienced, right? This gives you a sense of what it's like. They wanted to make sure that you knew what you were getting into if you came to the academy. And honestly, it was one of the most grueling seven days I had ever spent. But when I returned to Hawaii, I was convinced that this is where I was going to be for college. This is where God was leading me. By the way, this is what I looked like my senior year of high school. Gotta love the 80s poofy hair, right? And even guys had it. Uh, anyway, uh, my faith life at this time was just kind of, you know, eh, it was okay. I, I grew up in the church. I loved the Lord. I went to church, to, to church every Sunday. But I wasn't really, like, super excited about my faith and turned on for the Lord, if you will. I knew, though, that next summer, when I had to go to the Coast Guard Academy and uh, I had to face this, remember this picture? Yeah, when I had to face this... Then I would rely on God. My faith would grow. I'd be, what, 7,000, 5,000 miles away from home in Hawaii. I, I would need the Lord at that time. So why rush things my senior year? I could just continue to have a, you know, so-so faith, and then I'll work on it then. Uh, well, God had different plans. I started dating Jody in January of my senior year. We actually started doing Sunday morning double dating. Have you ever done that? Sunday morning double dating. It meant that we would go uh, together with her family to the Foursquare Gospel Church uh, at 8 a.m. And then when that finished around 9.30 or so, then we'd go cross down to the United Methodist Church where we'd sit with my family for the 10 o'clock uh, worship service. Uh, and uh, basically we wanted to make, let our parents know that neither was being led to the dark side by this new relationship, right? Uh, but... Soon, it turned out that despite my desire to just, you know, I'll put off my faith development later next summer when I go to the academy, uh, things started to change and started to deepen. And Jody and I would talk about uh, why this, your church does this or that, and what do you believe about this or that, and, and pretty soon, dang it, I wasn't growing closer to God. And it's a good thing, too, because when I was ultimately rejected by the Coast Guard Academy because of the medical reason of acne, it's another story, if you haven't heard it, I can tell you later, um, if I didn't have that renewed faith, I don't know if I would be able to get through that period. And it was that time after that final rejection that I felt God calling me into the ministry. So I tell you this story as a reminder when Jesus says to wait, it's not just sitting around waiting for something to happen. That, that didn't work. It's a time with hope and great expectations, wondering, looking for what God might be doing. It's a time spent praying and drawing close to the Lord, even if you don't know what's happening next in this season of your life. Now, it may not quite have been Star Wars-esque, but Luke's prologue in the book of Acts was setting the stage for what was about to come in book number two, namely the relationship uh, of Jesus Christ to the church that's being established by the power of the Holy Spirit. And for that power, they would have to wait. Now, with the prologue or preface or recap done, on to the meat of the second book, 
Acts 1, beginning at verse 6. So when they had come together, uh, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I want to quickly uh, remind you of the timeline so that you're uh, set on how all this is taking place, right? Jesus was arrested, tried, and convicted. Then he was executed. And this, as I mentioned earlier, sent the disciples into hiding. They thought they were going to be the next ones on the authorities list. But on that very first Easter, the risen Jesus appeared to some of the women followers of the disciples and then to the apostles. And then he spent 40 days with them, reminding them about the kingdom of God and getting them ready for the coming uh, of God's spirit that would empower them to be the early church. Now, throughout the history of Judaism, faithful people uh, believed that someday God would set everything straight. For, for many years, hundreds of years, uh, Israel dealt with a foreign oppressor. And, and during the time of Jesus, it was the Roman authorities. And so they longed for that time when God would come and make everything right, when God's kingdom would be established on earth, when, when, when they would be able to uh, have the autonomy and authority to guide and govern themselves. You can imagine that seeing their Savior rise from the dead, that would bring new hope that maybe it's finally starting to happen, that God's kingdom is about to take place. So they asked Jesus before he leaves, is now the time? Is this the time, Jesus? Is God finally going to kick out those Roman oppressors and set everything straight? I'm, I'm sure that they half expected Jesus to say, yes, yes, now is the time. Just be ready. It's coming. Not exactly how Jesus responded to their question, verses 7 and 8. Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You've heard about the famous uh, need-to-know basis, right? We're on a need-to-know basis, disciples, and you do not need to know what you just asked, right? It's a much more polite way than saying it's none of your business, but basically that's what Jesus is saying, right? God's timing is none of your business, disciples, and it's also none of our business as well. I think of this passage often when uh, some news item brings up speculation if certain current events uh, are, are signs that the end time is coming or, or of Jesus' second coming, right? Jesus told his disciples, don't worry about that. That's not your job to figure out God's timetable. You be faithful to what I've called you to do. And Jesus says, yeah, I, I, I've got two things for you to do, disciples, apostles. One, wait, right? You just have to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. But second, I've got a new task for you. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to be my witnesses. Which remember, the definition of apostle really is witness, right? To, to take something out, to carry something to give to someone else. They're being messengers of the gospel. Jesus has commissioned them and us to share his message of the kingdom of God beyond. So let's look at where it is that Jesus specifically told his disciples they're going to go. First, it's Jerusalem. Now they were already in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was arrested and tried and crucified. That's where the first Easter event happened. They're all ready in Jerusalem. The disciples, though, that's not where they were from. They spent so many days and weeks and months with Jesus in Jerusalem. I'm sure they knew the ins and outs of the city like the back of their hand. So it would not be hard to be a witness in Jerusalem because you're already there. You're already moving in and around the people, uh, and, and you know this community. For us today, Jerusalem, I think, is uh, the people that are closest to us, that we're called to, to be witnesses to the people closest to us, right? To our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates in school, uh, the people that we already know, hopefully they like us, we have a relationship with them, and so they'll be open to hearing uh, whatever it is we have to say. That is our Jerusalem today. Next, Jesus says, Judea. You're going out to Judea. Now, Judea was uh, the land in which Jerusalem resided. In fact, in, the ancient, in ancient Israel, Judea was known as the southern kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom, but really the whole nation was Israel, the north 
and the south together. Jerusalem was the capital of Judea, so Judea was basically filled with people who believed uh, alike, right? This, we might say today, this is our tribe. These are our people, right? People who think like us, worship like us, act like us, even, shall I say it, vote like us, right? We may not know these people, we've never met them before, but we would get along really well because they're just like us. That is Judea. It wouldn't be hard to witness in Judea because the people get us, right? But when you get to Samaria, things start to change a bit. Now, Samaria was a separate nation in between the northern and the southern kingdoms. Uh, it was north of Jerusalem and Judea. And although the Samaritans had an ancient connection to the people of Israel, by the time of Jesus and the book of Acts, they are not on a friendly basis. No, they are enemies. In fact, it's one thing to be tasked to share the message of the kingdom with, uh, with people that you know or people that, that think and, and act and believe like you, people from your own tribe. But it's another thing to have to reach out to your enemies. Now, we don't have a lot of enemies, but if you want to start to kind of get a sense of the uh, punch to the gut that this had for Jesus... How would you feel if God told you on your way home from church today, I really need you to go over and preach to the people of Al-Qaeda? It might be hard to find them, but I want you, I've got a plane ticket for you to head to uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and you're just going to be going up in the mountains looking for terrorists to tell them that God loves you. Right, that, that may, it might be a little bit of a, of a challenge, right? That is the effect that Samaria had when Jesus shared it. And if it wasn't enough, Jesus tacks on at the end and to the ends of the earth, right? This is the fine print that basically means, and anywhere else I decide to send you, you're going to go, right? These are the places that the disciples never even heard of, never dreamed that they would be heading to. This is the great unknown. This is the, uh, don't think that I've called you to a life of comfort and ease. No, the kingdom is far more important than your comfort. So one way of thinking about this call by Jesus is a series of concentric circles, right? We start in Jerusalem with our friends and family, the people that we love, that they already love us. We're in relationship with them. We're called to reach out to Judea, our own tribe, right? People just like us. And then really go beyond our comfort zone to Samaria, to our enemies, to the people that we already know we don't like. And then to top things off, Jesus says, oh, and also to the ends of the earth. Meaning, if we're going to be faithful in our call as followers of Jesus, we cannot dictate where we're going to go. But we need to be open for the Spirit's moving. It could be anywhere. Verse 9. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, Luke gives us a front row seat along with the apostles to watch Jesus being lifted up. What's that song? To see you high and lifted up. That's where this comes from, right? He's going up into heaven. Now, according to the Old Testament, the prophet Elisha, uh, Elijah was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. And so I'm sure uh, that Luke had some kind of connection with that when he was sharing this story. Just like Elijah, except no chariots and, and, and no fire. But Jesus is going up into heaven. And Biblical scholar Carl Holliday mentions that cloud imagery typically occurred in the ancient accounts of notable figures when they departed from this world, right? So people in the ancient world, when they heard this story and they heard clouds, oh yeah, someone significant is now departing. And I, I think of those times where whether you're at uh, Disneyland or at the, the AV Fair or someplace and some kid has a helium balloon and then accidentally lets it go and then what does everybody do? We just stay and watch it. It's like you can't take your eyes off of it, right? You have to keep staring until it either uh, tangles up in a power plant, which please don't let your uh, helium balloons go because of power lines. But if it misses the power lines, then we just kind of watch it until the wind blows it out of our sight. I, I imagine that's what the disciples were doing that day, right? Just watching Jesus. Right? Like, is he coming back? I, th I think he's gone. And they're standing there. When verse 10 happens, while he was going, they were gazing up towards heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes 
stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up to you from heaven into heaven will come the same way as you saw him going into heaven. Scholars believe the two men in white robes are probably angels, but they give the proverbial, don't just stand there, do something, right? Don't just stand there with your mouth agape, staring as Jesus is like a hot air balloon or a, a helium balloon going up into heaven. No, no, no. This is a time of active waiting. You're supposed to be waiting and praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a stand there and do nothing. It's a do something time. This is active waiting, being filled with prayer and drawing close to God. That's what Jesus was calling them to do. And I think in some ways we might be given that same command right now, that we're in this time of expectant waiting. I mean, just think about what we've been through in the last two and a half years, right, within the church, not this, just this church, but, but Christendom altogether. Everything has changed for the church, right? Everything has changed. Those who study the church tell us that very few churches around the country, at least here in the United States, have returned to their pre-pandemic numbers for in-person worship. You know where we're at? One-third. We're at one-third our numbers pre-pandemic that come back between the first and the second services. And while that may be discouraging to some, I think it's just the new reality, right? When the pandemic hit and we couldn't meet together for safety, churches were forced to go online uh, we didn't really know what to do. We were using my iPhone on a tripod those first couple Sundays. If you've continued worshiping with us from then, thank you so much, because it was not high tech. But then we developed, uh, we got the, the technology that we've needed, and we've been making our way. And while we may only have between 80 and 100 that come to in-person for the two services on Sunday, we have another 100 to 120 units watching us every week, worshiping with us whether that's an individual person or an entire family gathered around a computer or a smart TV. This is the new reality. And I think we're in this period of active waiting right now, waiting to see what God is going to do in and through the church. And again, not just through our church, but through all of Christianity. There's large numbers of folks who stopped connecting with our church during the pandemic. And they're not coming back, most likely. And while we mourn their loss and we grieve there's also been new folks that found us during the pandemic and started worshiping with us some who are also here in person as well a few that have even joined and become official members of our church it's a whole new reality and so in this period in this period of expectant waiting i invite each of us to don't just stand there but do something to have this posture of of, of hoping and praying, of asking what it is that God wants to do through us here at Palmdale United Methodist Church, whether we're here in person or connecting online, because you online are still very much a part of who we are in this new reality. Who does God want us to be? Who does God want us to be apostles to? Who is God sending us to connect his message of hope and love and grace to, to let others know that they're not alone, that life isn't one just big random happenstance, that God is working for good in their lives and in the world. Some of us, we may get to take the message to Jerusalem, the people we know and love, and maybe in our own family, our own neighborhood, or at work, that's who God is calling us to reach out to. Others, we may go to Judea, Samaria, who knows, the ends of the earth. It's not up to us to decide, but allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. You see, Luke knew that at some point, things were going to go south for Theophilus and his community. Right? When the world feels like it's starting to fall apart, when things come loose, when chaos threatens, when hurricanes rip through towns like Fort Myers, Florida, when all hope seems lost, Luke wanted people to know there is still someone there who knows and loves us and is working for good. Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, God the Father is there to be with us, to guide us through that. So hold tight. Don't lose hope. Cling to the promise that good is coming and God's kingdom will be on earth as it is in heaven. In the meantime, wait and pray. 
because something amazing is about to happen.